Adams State College. Great stories begin here. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gina Mitchell from uh, over in the ES building over there, giving us a presentation on brain and behavior, or sorry, exercise in the, in the brain. Uh huh. Well, thank you guys all for coming uh, this afternoon, and I am here to talk to you about exercise and the brain today. For many of us, um, I think when we hear the word exercise, we sometimes have a lot of different images or a lot of different thoughts come to our head. Sometimes I think we, we think about uh, maybe the misery or the pain or the agony of the physical exertion. And sometimes I think we think about all of the great benefits that exercise can have for us. So we might think about how it can energize us. We might think about how it's good for our health, how it can help prevent cardiovascular disease, or how it can help prevent diabetes, how it can maybe um, improve our mental function. All these great benefits uh, that we hear about all of the time. Today I really want to uh, focus on the exercises relationship with our mental function and try to give you uh, some really great examples uh, from research whereby they've shown that exercise and exercise interventions can actually improve your brain function and it can also uh, change your brain structure. Before we get into uh, that though, I'd like to just kind of take a little poll to see how much you guys uh, know about exercise. So, how many people know how much exercise you're supposed to get? <laughs> Anybody want to share that? At least an hour a day, 30 minutes a day. Any other thoughts on how much we're supposed to get? All right, if we look at the government's guidelines, we actually can see that they recommend a number of different types of exercise. So when we're talking about uh, aerobic exercise, for the average individual they do recommend uh, that you get about 30 minutes of exercise uh, on most days of the week or five to seven days of the week. Now if you're someone uh, who is overweight or if you're someone who has been overweight and is trying to maintain weight loss or trying to keep weight off, you might need extra exercise. And in this case, we have what we call the, the 30, 60, 90 rule. So the 30 minutes is, is good for the average individual. If you've been overweight and are trying to uh, maintain your weight loss, then you should uh, exercise at least an hour a day. And if you are obese or severely overweight, then you should get even more exercise. You should exercise 90 minutes a day. So that's aerobic exercise. What do we mean when we say aerobic exercise? What, what would be an example of it? Running. Running. Anything that can uh, get our heart rate up, um, maybe bicycling, swimming, those types of things. Something that taxes our, our cardiovascular system. We also um, have some recommendation for other types of exercise. So we uh, should also get some resistance training in and we should do that about two days per week and we should make sure that our resistance uh, training is going to exercise at least eight uh, major muscle groups. So you don't want to just uh, lift for your biceps or do some resistance for your arms or your upper body but you want to make sure that it's a kind of a, a comprehensive plan. And then the last piece of exercise involves doing some uh, flexibility exercises. And we should really attempt to do flexibility exercises every single day of the week. So you try to do uh, stretching. Uh, again, that involves most of your major muscle groups so that every part of your body uh, gets this type of, of activity. So how many people uh, think they meet or come close to meeting these guidelines? Some of you do, good job. If we look at the average American individual, we actually find that 74% of adults are not getting enough exercise or not uh, meeting these guidelines. 
And that really is uh, pretty unfortunate considering how good exercise can be for both our bodies and for our brains. So today, hopefully after you hear about how good exercise can be for you, uh, you'll take some of these recommendations uh, maybe a little bit more seriously and start to think about uh, changing your exercise program or increasing the amount of exercise you do. So I want to first start uh, by just giving you a, a brief little introduction to what your brain is, uh, what it looks like, and really what it does for us. So this picture uh, is roughly what your brain uh, looks like from the side view. So up here is going to be uh, the front, and then in the back we're going to have your, your cerebellum and your, your brain stem. For the average individual, uh, your brain weighs about three pounds, and it really has a consistency of jello. So it's kind of a, a mushy structure, which is why it's so easy to occur brain damage or why brain damage can uh, be so traumatic. And we also see that um, it's composed of a couple of different types of cells. We have what we call neurons, and then we have what we call glial cells. And you have um, over 100 billion uh, neurons and glial cells that compose your brain or make up your brain. So we really do have uh, a lot of these cells up there. And we can look at exercise as a way to protect those cells and also as a way uh, to make those cells uh, work better. So we're going to go through um, several different research uh, experiments and programs that have looked at how exercise affects all different parts of this brain. And we're going to start out uh, by looking at these things that we refer to as executive functions. So we call them uh, executive functions because they're considered to be higher order cognition. Things that you have to do that are related to goal-directed behaviors and that will really help you carry out a task or help you with uh, task completion. So within our executive functions, uh, we include ideas or things like planning, uh, judgment, making decisions, uh, response inhibition, which means that you can control yourself or you have impulse control. It also refers to your ability to ignore distracting things while you're completing a task. So let's say you're uh, taking a test and people keep walking in and out of the room. If you have some good response inhibition, you'll be able to keep focused on the task at hand and not get distracted by the other things around you. Um, our, our emotional control and our decision making is also uh, affected or considered part of this executive functions. So being able to regulate our emotions um, is really a big part of, of what we have to do uh, to stay in control of ourselves and to, con to keep uh, completing a task. Now when we look at these behaviors in relation to our brain, we see that they really are mediated by what we call our frontal lobe. And there's a couple areas or subdivisions of our frontal lobe that are particularly important for these functions. So we have, um, again, this picture of our brain here. And this is the front part, uh, which would be considered our frontal lobe. This time, though, you're getting an inside view of the brain, so we've cut it in half so that you can see what's on the inside. And one of the structures related to um, executive functions within this frontal lobe is what we call our anterior cingulate cortex, or our ACC. And you can see it here in the anterior uh, region of the frontal lobe. And then the other part um, that's important for us is our prefrontal cortex. And that would be the area here uh, that's in the far uh, frontal region. So it's in the, the front of the frontal lobe. So we have a couple of different uh, studies that have examined how these executive functions work and also how these brain areas work in relationship uh, to exercise. The first couple of studies uh, went through and they looked at individuals who are what we consider aerobically fit. So they took these individuals, they asked them about exercise habits, uh, they measured their VO2 max or their aerobic capacity, 
And then they went in and they looked at their brain while they were performing uh, tasks that use those executive functions. So they made them uh, perform uh, tasks and they would have all these kind of distractors come in and the individuals had to be able to pay attention to the task and um, avoid the distractors or not pay attention to the distractors. And when we compare those aerobically fit individuals to the non-aerobically fit individual, what we find is that their pattern of activation or their brain activity in their anterior cingulate cortex and in their prefrontal cortex is much more efficient. So they're better able to stay focused on the task and they're better able to, to perform on the task as well because their brains are working better. Now we see this effect not just in adults, but we also find it uh, in children. And these really have some uh, important implications for us because when we're children, our frontal lobes are, are still developing. In fact, our frontal lobes will take uh, until about our early 20s to completely develop. So in this case, we could look at exercise as maybe a strategy to increase the development of the frontal lobes or to promote the development of the frontal lobes. We also have um, a lot of disorders that are associated with um, improper functioning uh, in the frontal lobe childhood disorders as well as adult disorders. One of the most common that you probably hear about is uh, ADHD and we do find some trouble within the frontal lobes not working correctly and we also find that those children aren't able to uh, maintain attention or perform well on sustained attention tasks. So if we can get them exercising uh, it might be a strategy for improving their attention and helping their their frontal lobes develop better or develop more properly. With adults, we also find that our frontal lobes are deteriorating uh, at a fast rate as we're aging. So they are the last part of our brain to fully develop and it takes until the 20s and unfortunately they only work at optimal capacity uh, for about 10 years. And by the time you're 30, uh, those guys are starting to deteriorate again. So we will start to see in our 30s that you have uh, a decrease in performance again on attention, uh, decision making, planning, memory, all those types of higher order uh, functions. And we might be able to use exercise then as a way to stop some of those effects of aging and to help us maintain proper functioning in our frontal lobes for a longer period of time. Some research has actually uh, looked at exercise as an uh, intervention method or as a way to prevent aging. And what they did is they took uh, individuals who are between 60 and 79 years of age. So these are older adults. They've, uh, their frontal lobes have already been uh, deteriorating for a period of time. Their memories are uh, starting to deteriorate. They're not uh, processing things as fast as they used to. So these older adults came in and they engaged in an exercise program that lasted for six months and they engaged in three one-hour sessions uh, per week. So they uh, had the substantial amount of exercise occurring for those six months. And afterward uh, they went in and they did an MRI or a magnetic resonance imaging and they discovered that these individuals who had been in this exercise program for six months had actually increased their brain volume in their frontal cortex and also in their temporal cortex. So the temporal cortex is uh, behind your ear, behind your temporal bone. And it also uh, deteriorates as we start to age. So in this case, uh, we have some demonstration of the protective effects of exercise and we can see that really exercise can help fight off those effects of aging. Now when we say that uh, term brain volume or an increase in uh, brain volume, sometimes it's kind of confusing because you think, well, they, their brains got bigger, they got more brains. Um, but an increase in uh, brain volume doesn't actually in 
indicate that you grew more brain cells or that the the brain got bigger, what it indicates is that there's some type of change in the structure. So an increase in brain volume could be caused by um, an increase in the capillaries in the brain, so there's more blood flowing there, which you would expect knowing the, the cardiovascular effects of exercise. Um, and we could also have changes in the size and in the shape of the cells that are currently there. So they can make more connections uh, with the other cells that are around them and those increased connections then will increase the functioning of those areas of the brain. So this image uh, down here shows you really the, the specific areas in the brain where these increased brain volumes were found. So here uh, we have that inside view of the brain again and you can see this blue um, is an increase in our anterior cingulate cortex and then also uh, in our supplementary motor area. So an area of the brain that's controlling your motor functions. So it can get improved motor functioning really after um, training on motor exercises. And then this yellow area um, is an area that's what we call the anterior white matter. And it's particularly related to the processing um, between the sides of your brain. So you have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. You have two sides. And when we increase uh, function or brain volume there, we're going to see increased transmission across the, the left and right hemispheres or better uh, connection between those two areas of the brain. Um, in the middle, again, you see the anterior cingulate cortex and the supplementary motor area. And the same thing um, on the third one. The other thing that you see over here is the, the temporal lobe area where we have, um, again, increased brain volume. The temporal lobe uh, is important for us because this is an area of the brain that's related to our long-term memory. So if we can increase brain volume um, in that temporal lobe, we should be able to also uh, increase long-term memory or increase our memory function. Um, the idea or kind of uh, the hypothesis for application of this study is that um, we can look at these areas of the brain, the frontal and the, the temporal cortices, and we can see that they do deteriorate very rapidly with aging and then also with disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So we might be able to uh, take some of these ideas here and apply them maybe as a, a way to prevent the development of dementia or to prevent the development of Alzheimer's. Now there hasn't been a lot of research done to see if um, you can roll back the deterioration. So if you already have Alzheimer's disease and you start exercising, can you regain some of that memory? We really don't know um, if that can happen or not, but we know if you exercise before you get it, uh, it can maybe protect against some of the effects of it. Our next area um, to look at with exercise in our brain um, is something that we call neurogenesis. So neurogenesis uh, refers to the formation of new brain cells or the formation of new neurons within the brain. And this is an idea that's kind of foreign uh, to a lot of people because we're typically taught that you're born with all the brain cells uh, that you're ever going to have and there's no way uh, to grow new neurons. And that idea has been shown um, in the last 20 years or so to be uh, completely false. You actually can grow new neurons and your brain does continue to produce new neurons throughout your life. The area of our brain where we find this uh, most prolific or occurring most um, is in this structure right here, it's flashing for you, our hippocampus. And this hippocampus um, is another structure in our brain that's related to memory and to the formation of long-term memories. And we particularly see that uh, neurogenesis will occur for you when you are learning something new so if you're actively studying uh, for an exam or for a test, we'll find uh, neurogenesis occur. Or if you're training or doing something new, 
again, we can see that uh, neurogenesis does occur. Now, since this concept um, has been discovered, it's mostly uh, been studied within rat populations because we can look at their brain and we can count the number of new cells uh, much easier than we can uh, within the human because we can um, sacrifice them and we can um, look at the intervention and then look at the, the outcome of that intervention. For humans, we have to get a little bit more creati creative. Nevertheless, we really have discovered that some things in our lives can depress this neurogenesis or some things in our life uh, can promote this neurogenesis. So aging and stress are two things uh, that we have found to be detrimental uh, to neurogenesis. So if you're trying to study, uh, don't stress yourself out too much because you're really working against yourself. Uh, you need to have uh, relaxation and you need to have that optimal level of stress to make things turn out right. For increasing uh, neurogenesis, we can see that a more enriched environment, so uh, a more stimulating environment, uh, one where you're very active, uh, you don't sit in front of the TV all day, instead you do crossword puzzles or you um, are physically active or you're engaging in conversation uh, with other people or you have lots of social activity going on. We can also see studying uh, will increase it again and then what we're most interested in today, uh, exercise. So if we look at um, a couple of the rat studies that are out there looking at uh, neurogenesis, we really do find that across the board exercise is the best way uh, to increase neurogenesis uh, in the brain. So you can try to teach those rats um, how to go through 20 different mazes, or you can give those rats uh, the most stimulating environment that exists. But really the best thing uh, to do for them to promote neurogenesis is to give them access to a, a wheel that they can run on. And when they can engage in that physical activity or that exercise, we will see those brain cells start to grow and start to develop right away. However, uh, some research has looked at the interactions between exercise and the increase in neurogenesis and also some of those things that uh, depress neurogenesis. So one study uh, in particular that's pretty interesting was one where they took um, rats and they made them engage in this exercise program for a period of time. And some of the rats uh, got to be in group housing, so they got to have some social activity. And the other rats, they had to live uh, by themselves. So they were socially isolated from everybody else. And they looked at what happens with neurogenesis, and then also what happens with stress levels to these rats. And they found that the ones that were in isolation, they didn't get, get the same positive effects from the exercise. And so they weren't exhibiting the same type or neurogenesis to the same extent as our other group that was in the group housing. So the researchers kept looking and trying to figure out exactly what was going on to cause this. And they went in and they measured all different levels of, or all different kinds of stress hormones. And they found that those rats that were living alone were stressed out and that they had lo higher levels of, of stress hormone. And so the conclusion was that those increases in stress and stress hormone was actually working against uh, the exercise. So in this case it shows us that really it's not just exercise itself that's at work on your brain, but really your whole environment is. And we do need to pay attention to the other types of things that we're doing if we want to promote the best brain health or the best brain functioning. So stay away from uh, social isolation or uh, living alone maybe. Uh, if you can incorporate more social activity, uh, you can see better, benef better benefits come from that exercise regimen. 
Now we do have a, a couple of studies that have been able to examine uh, neurogenesis in human and sometimes these are a little bit better uh, to examine because when we look at a rodent model and then we try to apply it to humans we're not always sure if um, the brain is working the same or if the environment's going to be the same or what factors are, are we really looking at. In order to examine how uh, neurogenesis occurs in humans again we can't uh, do an autopsy and count the number of new brain cells after a, an intervention. So we have to figure out what kind of things that we can measure will indicate neurogenesis. And so some researchers at uh, Columbia University actually did a really good job of coming up with a, a solution to this problem. And what they did is they took their, their rats and they put them through the exercise intervention and they measured uh, the brain functioning in the rats through MRI. So the same way we would measure human brain functioning. And they discovered that while those rats were engaging in the exercise program and then two weeks after uh, engaging in that exercise program, those rats had more blood flow uh, to the hippocampus. So the area of the brain uh, that is producing neurogenesis or where neurogenesis is occurring. And then they wanted to see, okay, well, we've got this increased blood flow. Does that really correlate uh, with neurogenesis? So they sacrificed the rats after they uh, did their exercise intervention. And they looked in the brain, and they did find that there were cells in there that were growing during the time of uh, the intervention and also two weeks after it. So they said, well, blood flow must correlate uh, with neurogenesis. So when the new cells are being produced, we're going to send more blood to that area of the brain. So now that we have this relationship between uh, blood flow and neurogenesis, we can take a look at human blood flow and we can see what that might indicate uh, about neurogenesis. So then they took their humans, uh, they made them exercise one hour a day for four days a week. They did an MRI uh, pre-exercise and post-exercise and they found that in fact after the exercise occurred uh, there was increased blood flow uh, to the hippocampus. So by exercising uh, we can increase the production of new cells in the brain and we can also see some behavioral changes as well. So these folks uh, that were in this program, they got a memory test uh, before they started exercising and also after they started exercising. And their performance on the memory test improved uh, after the exercise had occurred. So it's not just a change in brain structure, but it also does lead to measurable uh, changes in our behavior. And in this case, since we're talking about uh, the hippocampus, it is particularly uh, related to that, um, the memory function. Now, when we look at how exercise increases uh, neurogenesis or maybe why exercise uh, increases neurogenesis, we can also take a look um, at another chemical in our brain that we call uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF, much easier to say. So this is a chemical um, that really is associated uh, with neurogenesis occurring, and it is produced uh, within our hippocampus. And if we look at its functions, we do find that really uh, it has a role in helping those new neurons survive helping form new neurons and also helping us form memories and helping us learn things. So BDNF maybe is a um, what's behind neurogenesis. If we can increase this chemical then we can increase neurogenesis and we can increase memory and learning and brain function. So we've also got a number of, of research experiments that have looked at what does exercise do uh, to this particular chemical? And most of the research um, has been very positive to suggest that 
there is a significant relationship between how much exercise you get and levels of BDNF uh, in your brain. This is uh, much easier research to do maybe because we can measure the levels of BDNF uh, through a blood sample. So we don't have to uh, worry about rats or we don't have to do any type of fancy imaging. We can take a quick blood sample and then see what levels, uh, what kinds of levels you have. Um, a number of different studies have shown that even just one time or uh, one session of exercise can significantly uh, increase the level of BDNF in the brain. So if you go exercise today, uh, you can start to maybe start this process of uh, growing new brain cells or improving your memory. We also do find that the amount of the increase is related to how much exercise we do or how intensely we exercise. And the more intensely we exercise, the larger uh, the increase we're going to have. So if you're just out there exercising uh, to have fun or kind of leisurely, you won't see uh, the same type of changes. The more you exercise, uh, the larger release of this you're going to get. And the more benefits then really you're going to see later on. We also do find that if we look at um, like elite athletes or athletes who have been uh, training for a significant amount of time, that their baseline levels of BDNF will be higher than your, your average individual. So it's not just an acute effect that occurs right after the exercise, but it's something that can stick around and be long lasting. So we'll get a, an elevated level even when we're not exercising. And again, that's what we want if we want to um, grow new brain cells and we want to have uh, better brain function. The final thing um, about BDNF is that uh, in some cases, when we exercise and we elevate our levels of uh, BDNF, it can help uh, reverse some of the damage that we maybe do uh, in other areas of our lives. So most people um, in the United States have a diet that's high in uh, saturated fats and a diet that's high in refined sugars. And both of those things are not good for our brains. Both of them will decrease um, the levels of BDNF within the brain and possibly maybe could slow down uh, neurogenesis because of that. So if we exercise and we eat a high fat diet, we can level things out because the exercise will increase uh, the BDNF that our, our high fat diet uh, is decreasing. So we get maybe a, a protective effect. So if you can't do everything uh, that they recommend, you can't eat healthy and exercise, at least if you can do one of those things, <laughs> uh, you can see some maybe change or you can see some protection uh, from the exercise. Is it possible when you, when you discover something like BDNF that's good for your brain, is it possible to start thinking about uh, BDNF pills or shots? Or um, <laughs> in other cases, it is. I mean, that's what a lot of uh, pharmacological agents do. I've never heard anything if we can make this or if it's possible to make it or not. Smart. Right, I know. <laughs> uh, all right. So BDNF is something that we, we want to increase and that can be beneficial and that can be increased uh, through exercise. Our last little thing uh, to take a look at today is depression and how it can be um, affected by exercise. So depression sometimes is uh, referred to as our, our common cold of uh, psychological disorders because it is very common and we do see it uh, very often in American society. And we find that if we look at exercise uh, as a treatment for depression, it's something that can be uh, pretty beneficial for us. So if you take somebody who is depressed and you put them on an exercise regimen, uh, that's what they're familiar with. So you don't uh, try to go make them run marathons if they're not uh, runners or you don't uh, make them engage in three hour exercise session if they haven't exercised in two years. 
but you start them out slow and you give them a program that they can handle. You can actually find that the exercise will work just as well uh, as an antidepressant for treatment uh, for depression. So um, this is maybe an alternative way uh, to pharmacological treatment, a much easier, uh, cheaper method. Uh, also really with no horrible side effects that we might find uh, from antidepressants. And the treatment is equally as effective. So we don't have any problems with um, it not working because our studies do show us that it is just as effective. Now if we look at um, really what is the mechanism behind this, we do actually find that exercise works uh, really in the same way uh, that most antidepressants uh, work. So antidepressants usually target our neurotransmitter uh, serotonin. So serotonin is related to a whole number of uh, functions in your body, particularly mood regulation uh, is what would be important here. And individuals that are depressed tend to have low levels of, of serotonin. So antidepressants are designed to increase those levels of serotonin. And if we look at what exercise does for you, uh, we also find that it will increase the levels of serotonin in your cortex. So that's the outer layer of your brain. And it also increases the levels of uh, serotonin in your hippocampus. And antidepressants do really the same thing. We also find that both exercise and antidepressants uh, do increase neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And that's really thought to be um, one of the major effects or one of the major reasons that they can work or that they can help the depressed individual by changing the structure of the brain, increasing the number of cells, and those levels of serotonin increasing, we can get some better mood regulation and we can get some uh, improved mood. So you don't really need drugs though uh, to get this. You can do a simple uh, behavioral modification, increase the exercise, and we can see these same benefits. So really if we take a look at uh, everything kind of together here, we do have substantial evidence uh, that exists out there to show us that exercise does produce measurable changes in our brain structure. And those changes in structure are not just um, insignificant. They really are correlated uh, with changes in behavior and changes in behavior in, in positive manners. We see better brain function uh, and we see better behavioral performance after uh, we've gone through exercise or even when we compare the aerobically fit individual uh, to the non-aerobically fit uh, individual. So, do you guys have questions? Um, in terms of uh, brain function, I was wondering if there are any studies to show whether there's an optimum level of exercise beyond which I have I've never seen uh, anything on that. One thing I, I have seen though is on the levels of uh, BDNF and there was a study recently that um, found that when people had really elevated levels of BDNF that it actually uh, increased their risk for diabetes. So in that case we might see some some negative effects occurring, um, but that's only one study in comparison to a whole slew of research that has found the higher the level, the better the, the brain functioning. Um, I was wondering if there was, uh, if you had found any evidence uh, on a possible correlation between uh, brain degradation due to aging and schooling. Like usually a lot of time in about 30 or out of school, you've been at a job for a couple years, so you're familiar with it, so you don't have to learn as much. Mm. Um, 
Well, uh, really the, the development of the brain, now I talked about how the frontal lobes don't develop until you're 20 and then they start deteriorating when you're 30, um, really is the, the normal course of uh, brain development. But when you do get into situations where you become kind of stagnant and you're not learning new things or you're not um, being very active, that does cause more deterioration. So the the brain is like your muscles. Uh, if you want to keep them, you have to use them. So if we want to keep our brain, uh, we have to use it. So you can prevent some of that deterioration due to age by using it, but really the, the normal course of aging will, will take place no matter what. You had mentioned that uh, after exercise you have elevated levels of DDNF. How long does that last? Um, you know, it, it depends. <laughs> um, some studies have shown that it, it lasts about two hours and then it will decrease and then if we wait several more hours uh, the level will start to come back up again. So it's um, not a, a consistent elevated level that we find for a, a period of time. And, well, that's kind of a secondary question. Um, you said the blood flow increases the hippocampus mm -hmm. after exercise. I'm guessing this is true in humans and both, right? Right, yes. Um, and that, that lasts for around, the elevated levels of blood flow last for about two weeks? Um, well, for the rats, what they, were, they did a, a six-week uh, study, so they measured right when they start, started exercising, and they only allowed them to exercise for two weeks. So during the two-week exercise program, the blood flow was increased, and then two weeks following the exercise program, the blood flow was still increased. Okay. So I guess my question is then, if, if that happens the same in, in humans, does the hippocampus play a role in your emotions as well? Um, so if you did something like an Ironman event, a lot of times people get kind of depressed a couple of weeks after the event. And I'm wondering, is it because there's a decrease in blood flow to their hippocampus? <laughs> they, they got used to having a, a high blood flow, and now it's slightly decreased, and it's affecting their emotions that way. Um, the hippocampus is, uh, let's see if we go back to that picture here. Um, it's connected right here with this amygdala and then also several structures under here that are uh, important for emotional regulation. It's mostly important though for the emotional memories that we have. So um, when we look at depression, we do find changes in uh, the hippocampus. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily the structure that people would say is uh, causing depression or we, if we ha don't have blood flow there then we will get depression. Um, so it could be a, a correlate or a, a structure that's important for causing that depression after Ironman but I'm not uh, real sure if it would be or not. Um, as for the effect of exercise on depression, um, is it um, most of the studies are looking at major depressive disorder, so um, they're looking at people who have been uh, severely depressed and then what the outcome is. And would it possibly work for like those with bipolar disorder or those that any, any other disorders that... Um, it's been looked at with anxiety uh, as well and we do find some, some good effects for it there. Um, bipolar disorder, I'm not sure if it can be a, used as a treatment for that. And in fact, there are studies like that out there whereby the kids will go ride a bike for 10 minutes and then they'll come in and they'll um, look at how they perform in school and they do seem to be more relaxed, more attentive uh, and perform at a higher rate uh, after they've gotten that little burst of exercise in their day. Adams State College, great stories begin here.